This is Paul Schneiderman today on the 120th edition of the Sports Untold podcast, also on Rainier Avenue Radio. My special guest today in the 120th edition is Seattle Kraken play-by-play TV broadcaster John Forslund. John, we'll get back to you in a minute. Uh, my podcast is now on Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, Google, iTunes, Podbean. You can go to sportsuntoldpodcast.com. I encourage my listeners to click the like button, like button regarding my show, comment, and go to sportsuntoldpodcast.com, and you can click on my show on some other outlets as well. Well, John, I'm going to get back to you. Uh, John Forslund is known as one of the great hockey TV play-by-play announcers in North America. John is an award-winning announcer. Mr. Forslund is an East Coast native. He had a long career with the Hartford Whalers, who later became the Carolina Hurricanes. I believe John worked in the Whalers Hurricanes organization for about 1991 till 2020. Uh, John was once a broadcaster, I learned, um, the American Hockey League, for the American Hockey League Springfield Indians. Um, John has broadcasted hockey games for ESPN, National Hockey Night, and NBC Sports. And jo- we've had John in the Northwest now for over a year. Uh, John joins the ranks of many esteemed sports broadcasters who've come from the Northwest. Although Seattle is not as large city as say New York, LA, or Chicago. We've had some terrific sports announcers here, such as the late Bob Blackburn with the Sonics and the late Dave Niehaus, the late Pete Gross. Don't want to miss anybody here, but some of our current announcers in the Northwest, Kevin Calabro, Dave Sims, Steve Rabel, Bob Rondo, and then John Forslund joins those ranks of, uh, of, a, of have a very good broad, pro sports broad, college broadcast in the Northwest. Um, John will definitely go down in history as, uh, as a major part of the introduction of the crack in the NHL to the fans of Pacific Northwest. John and his TV and radio crew are certainly part of my introduction as a Seattle sports fan. John, real quickly, have you heard this before? Um, I see a little Caleb, Kevin Calabro in you and a little you, Kevin, John Forslund and Kevin Calabro. Have you heard that before? And well, Paul, first of all, it, it's a real pleasure to be with you. And um, I really appreciate everything you said and the company that you put me in. I hope I can live up to that over what I hope is a, a long career in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. Um, yeah, there's been a, a couple of people who've mentioned Kevin's name. The, the funny thing about this is one of the first people to reach out to me on social media when I got the job was Kevin. Uh, I knew of Kevin, obviously, but I had never met Kevin, still haven't, but we, we've gone back and forth a little bit on social media channels, and I really appreciate, you know, what he had to say. It was a, it was a welcome, and uh, coming from someone who has a rich history, and I really respect his work, still do, um, but again, I'm trying to find my place in the Seattle sports landscape, which, um, you know, goes a a long, long way back. And I appreciate it because I was well aware of it a long, long way back. So all the names that you brought up, I already knew of. Uh, I had never been to Seattle until I came for the expansion draft a year ago. Um, But I just finished the greatest year of my career. That's how I look at it. And I'm very happy to be part of it and, and hope to spend the next few minutes with you the same way. Oh, what love it. That's great. John, by the way, if I look at my phone at times during the interview, it's just try to see if we get some comments in the audience on Facebook. So I don't okay. want to think I'm ignoring. Yeah, no you. problem. Just gonna, there's, we're hoping only, to only only the only the good stuff. Okay. That's right. That's right. You gotta oh, screen we'll, we'll, it we'll all. There'll be good stuff for sure. <laughs> well, that's neat. And have you had any interactions with some of the other Seattle area team broadcasters like Sims or Rick Riz, the mayors. I, I know it's sort of an interesting fraternity and sorority of broadcasters and in, in sports communities. Have you had any interactions with some of those fellows? Quite a bit with Dave Sims, um, who I had, I had met a few, many, many years ago. Um, but again, he did the same thing, connected with me, told me about the area. Our off seasons crisscross, so it's really hard to get some social time together. Um, he was actually going to come to the booth at Climate Pledge Arena for a hockey game and came down with COVID um, and couldn't make it near the end of the season. And I was really looking forward to have him be a, a guest in our booth. Everett Fitzhugh was going to have him over on the radio side. Would have been really cool. It, it didn't work out uh, for those reasons. Um, Rick, I have not met yet. Um, Aaron, I have. Um, and a lot of the root people, obviously, that work in and around the Mariner shows, um, both on camera and off camera. It's a really great group of people. So obviously, I've met all of those people. 
and there's Steve Rabel, the Seahawks. There's so many. I don't want to miss anybody. Yeah. But it, it's neat that you've had some interactions, some of the other. You know what? I, I did meet Jim Zorn uh, the very first week of our training camp. Uh, Jim came over and watched a few practices, and it was a chance meeting. And um, I, I kind of figured it out along the way who he was. And he was asking a lot of questions about the game. And, of course, uh, I remember him from way back when, to in the glory days of the, the kingdom, uh, so to speak. So, anyway, that, that was a thrill for me because I, I remember that, that big number 10 on the front of the jersey was almost as big as the number 10 in the back. That's what I remember. Those were fun years. Well, it's neat, Johnny. You, you just came to Seattle for the first time for the expansion draft, and, you, and you've become such a part of the community. Well, again, thank you for coming on uh, Sports Untold, John, also on Rainier Ave Radio. And uh, should we start with, hey, hey, what do you say? You know, that's, Yeah, that's fine. That's yeah, good. So your, I like that. John's, uh, trademark catchphrases. Well, John, you know, um, as we're watching you, watching you as a TV broadcaster, a, a lot of fans – don't always know a lot about the people they watch and hear. And why don't you just share with us how you got the broadcasting bug and what contributed your interest in broadcasting hockey? Well, it, it, they go hand in hand. It's a great question. It goes all the way back to 1970. So I was eight years old. You can do the math on my age now. So I was eight years, eight years old. And the Boston Bruins, I grew up in Western Massachusetts, and the Boston Bruins of Bobby Orr were the big thing. And they won a Stanley Cup in 1970. And I remember exactly where I was. It was early May. Um, I was at my aunt's house, Mother's Day. It was a Sunday afternoon, and Bobby Orr scored the climactic goal, which has been immortalized with him diving through the air in the fourth game in overtime to sweep the St. Louis Blues and win the Stanley Cup. And what happened that day was I not only fell in love with the game, but I fell in love with the cadence of the broadcasting of hockey. And the man who was responsible for the great call that day on CBS was a guy named Dan Kelly, who was a longtime voice of the St. Louis Blues and did national work on the CBS package. And, you know, he became kind of an influence for me. And at that time, I decided I needed a little bit of a hobby. I played all kinds of sports growing up, as we all did. But I started broadcasting hockey games off the television. And my dad did color for me. And this went on for years and years. And we were lucky in, in Springfield, Massachusetts, 90 miles west of Boston, to bring in the Bruins games. They, they aired every game on television, even in those days. But we had an old parabolic antenna with a booster from Sears and Roebuck that was attached to it. He went up on a ladder physically every night and positioned it so we get the game in without too much fuzz and distortion. His friends would come over, have a few beverages, and I would sit in the middle of our family room and broadcast the game. And dad would do color. Now we did that, you know, until probably I was 16 or so, and I kind of, you know, put it aside. And but I always immersed myself in that, and I wasn't a great reader. So my mom, who was a real positive influence in my life, was someone who said, "You know what? You need to read more." I said, "Ma, I hate reading. Um, I I can't. It doesn't." captivate my attention. I, you know, like most kids, I didn't have the attention span and nor did I see the benefits of comprehension until later, but she made me read everything about a sport I didn't know much about, which was hockey. Now I played a lot of baseball. I loved baseball. I loved football and basketball, but hockey history and anything about hockey. I went to the library, took the books out, read, immersed myself in the history. Now to get to the end of the game here, when I went to college, I did not go to school for broadcasting, but I took an elective course. It was taught by a news director from an NBC station. At the end of that course, the final exam was a VO, a voiceover of the 1981 Super Bowl between the Bengals and the 49ers. I prepared for it the way I thought I should because I had done this you know, for a long time, sat down and announced the football game. Well, the, the professor who was that news director offered me a job uh, as an anchor at one of their sister stations out West. I was only a junior at the time and I wasn't going to do that. But he did tell me if anybody gives you a chance to go into broadcasting, go for it, because what you have is a knack that can't really be taught in a classroom. I kept it in the back of my mind. One thing led to another, went to graduate school for sports administration, took an internship in the American Hockey League. That owner gave me a chance to get on the air by asking me the following question, do you have any broadcast experience? I said, I have got a great deal. Now he didn't ask me for a tape, 
He didn't ask me for who. He didn't ask me if I was ever paid for it. All the experience I was talking about was with my dad at home. And anyway, I went for it and he hired me and I did color the first year. Then that play by play guy left. I took his job. I did it for seven years. Then I went to Hartford and there you go. And, and I've done other sports too. I've done college football. I've done basketball. I've done a little tennis, but nothing sparked passion like hockey. I think it was because of my relationship with my father. We went to games together. We had a minor league team in that city. We went every weekend. So that's probably why. And since 1991, it's been my vocation. And luckily enough, now I'm in Seattle. What a journey. What a journey. And uh spending time with your dad and your love of the Boston Bruins. Do you, are you still a Boston sports fan, John? Uh, the Red Sox. I, I, I really don't want to bring that up this summer, uh, the way things are going right now. But the Red Sox, for sure. Every allegiance with hockey wanes once you become professional. Um, so I, my favorite team, obviously, is the one I worked for. My favorite team before that was the one I worked for then, which was the only other team in the NHL I ever worked for. So I was lucky to be with one team for almost 25 years before the Seattle opportunity. Um, in basketball, mm, I don't know, um, maybe a little bit with the Celtics, but that goes a long way back. And in football, my favorite team um, I've adopted now are the Seahawks. Oh. Um, I, 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 you know, it's funny because when I was a kid, um, I go back to remembering the Supersonics with Sigma and downtown Freddie Brown and the wizard Gus Williams and all these guys uh, in the kingdom. And I remember watching those great playoff series especially against the Washington Bullets I, I, I remember that vividly and I remember the mystique of Seattle and the crowds and the way they behaved same thing with the Seahawks I think over time I kind of really admired what they've been able to do there in terms of their fan base um, going way back I was a Kansas City Chiefs fan only because I was a front runner in the early 70s and they were good but now that I live in Seattle I really follow them and I follow the Mariners too. I kind of locked in last year. Um, so I'm a baseball junkie. I watch early baseball when I can and late baseball. So I watch the Red Sox lose. And of late, I watch the Mariners win almost every night. It's a lot of fun. R Real sports fan, John. John, you mentioned you have a master's degree in athletic management. I believe it's from Adelphi yeah. University. I'm curious, has this master's degree been helpful in your career and specifically your career as a broadcaster anyways? I think so, because it gives me a general understanding of the entire organization and what everybody has to do. And in the seven years that I worked in the American Hockey League, I did a variety of jobs. There was only four people in the front office, the owner of the team, a general manager, a business manager, a part-time salesperson, and myself. And I did sales, I did PR, I did marketing, and I was told, the, the even though it was important to me, for the owner, the only thing he cared about was everything else but my broadcast. It was the it was the, the least most important thing to him. It didn't, didn't generate any revenue for him, and it cost him money to pay me, which wasn't a lot, but it was uh, it was enough to for, to get me started in this business. So I took that with me to Hartford because my first job in Hartford, Paul, was as a PR director. Um, I had to make a decision after seven years. I had a lot of denial and I wasn't going very far with my broadcasting. I all, was almost at a point where I was ready to quit. And um, the opportunity to go to Hartford as a PR director was offered to me. It was a huge jump in salary. I took it. I told them it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I continued to be a freelance broadcaster and call some minor league hockey on the side on television. And then with an ownership change around 1994, the new owners came in and asked me what I wanted to do. And I told them, here's what I'm doing. I'm applying for other teams in the NHL as a play-by-play -play broadcaster. I'm not interested in this but I'll do it to help you out and get you started, which I did. But that new ownership group, and most importantly, Jim Rutherford, the general manager and president of the team, gave me my first gig as an announcer in 1995. So you definitely feel a tie to those guys that gave you your first I do. gig. I, I, I do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, what a journey. And uh, John, I asked Dave Sims this question. I'm going to ask you this question. If you didn't go the sports broadcasting route, and you had a great run as a sport, sports broadcaster, what career do you think you would have gotten into if you did not go into sports? I was going to be a teacher and a coach. I was going to try and coach high school baseball, maybe a level up. I don't know if I would ever have coached in college. I did play a bit, as I said. Um, but I, I really enjoyed kids, and I enjoyed education. 
Um, there's a lot of pitfalls that go along with that, um, you know, especially the inner workings of the teaching profession and all of that. But, um, you know, that's what I was trained to do. That's what I was going to do. And then I had to make a shift. But, you know, fate plays a big role in whatever we do. Right. True. So I kind of I kind of think that's the direction I was going to go. I continued to coach youth sports when my son was younger in North Carolina, really enjoyed it. Um, but I love children. I love kids, especially, um, you know, kids from, say, 13 on, on up. I was a certified high school uh, teacher and coach, um, and I was going to coach a little bit of baseball, and that was kind of a decision, too. I had an opportunity on Long Island to do that, and I had to make a decision to kind of go to that internship with hockey and stay there. I had, I had a job offer to go back and work at a prep school, teach and coach, and I kind of gave up on that. Edu background as an educator too did not know that well this is this fun to learn more about more about you and your background john john you know you had a long run with the carolina hurricanes and yeah. was your biggest highlight when you were with the hurricanes when they won the stanley cup in 2006 yeah i think from a from the team standpoint yes um some of the the big highlights for me centered around other people. So in other words, three of the most uh, um, highlight moments for me um, were emceeing Jersey retirement nights for Ron Francis, the current Kraken general manager, uh, Rod Brindamore, the current coach of the uh, Carolina Hurricanes, and Glenn Wesley, who played 23 years for us, and he had his number two retired. He's now a development coach with St. Louis Blues. So um, those nights are really cool because you're out there in front of 20,000 alone, and it's their night. And, you know, you've got to make sure that you make it special for them. Um, and it's really neat to be part of it that your career kind of puts you in that spot. Um, at the, at the uh, expense of sounding a little hokey and corny, um, every game, Paul, makes me excited. Every game that I do, whether it be a preseason game, regular season game, or playoff games, I get equally excited for every single game I do. That's just the way I'm wired. Yes, the playoff games are great. There were some great moments. There's also a 10-year period in North Carolina where the Hurricanes didn't make the playoffs. And those seasons were a challenge because when you're a team broadcaster and the team does not play well, you got to do your best, believe it or not, not to get fired. And not to get the, because the people you work for might not like what you're saying. There's nothing but negative things to talk about. You have to earn trust with your fan base. You can't pull the wool over their, their, those eyes. You, you can't be a Pollyanna Homer. And when the team's going down a bad road, you know, present this real positive view of the world, right. you know, people aren't going to buy it. The fans aren't going to buy it. So um, to me, those were challenges that I found very rewarding when the team got back to the playoffs. Now they've made it four years in a row. But I think game seven, 2006, I uh, was part of the radio broadcast that night when they won the Stanley Cup. My son was in the booth next to me. Um, and that was really that was really neat. He was eight or nine years old at the time. And so um, those are great moments. And I think that link, having him there was just as great as a team winning. Neat stories in your years uh, with the Hurricanes franchise. John, back up for a second. Um, I've been to Springfield, Massachusetts. And for the listeners, the Basketball Hall of Fame is there. So I want to yeah. share with you that I'm, I'm familiar with your hometown. And I have been to the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield. So I thought I'd That's a new place. I mean, uh, you know, I went to Springfield College where the game was invented by Dr. James Naismith. Uh, they still had, well, they did when I was there, peach baskets, you know, in memoriam up in the old Judd Gymnasium where supposedly a bunch of YMCA guys got together because it was a YMCA school at the time. And he developed something to keep uh, football players uh, in shape during the wintertime. A Canadian, uh, by all means, James Naismith, by way of Kansas, you know, got there, as we all know, and uh, and there it is but it's a unique city it has a really rich sports history for its size and a lot of great um legendary people have come out of springfield um larry o'brien the old commissioner of the national basketball association uh through the 70s i think into the early 80s uh, went to my high school nick bonacani played for the Miami Dolphins, went to my high school. Uh, Billy Guerin, who's now the GM of the Minnesota Wild, grew up about five miles away from my, from my house. So there's a lot of sports history in, in Springfield for whatever reason. 
neat, neat, neat background there for sure. I, I was I was at a wedding back in 2006 in the Berkshire region, and my Damn. stepfather and I did a, a little excursion and checked out the basketball hall of fame. So that's a, a memory I have that's of cool. Springfield. Yeah, that's John, cool. you know, as you know, we went through a really brutal franchise relocation battle when the Sonics moved to Oklahoma City. So a lot of people in Seattle, I think, connect with the hearts yeah. of fans who have felt ripped when they've lost franchises. John, there's a story that you did that you were a broadcast in the final Hartford Whalers um, game, knowing they were going to be relocating. And apparently you got teary eyed. It was a, it was an emotional moment. Feel free to share a little bit of that moment, John, but also um, do you think the NHL would ever come back to Hartford? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, the last part of the question. I, I don't think so. I think it's a, it's a unique market. There's a lot of hockey fans there. Youth hockey is really strong. But I think geographically, Paul, being wedged between Boston and New York hurts Hartford. It's really, it's, it's a big city. It's the capital of Connecticut, obviously. But it's not big enough when it comes to, you know, the companies that you need and the revenue that you need to generate from advertising. So if you um, are the ad agency for Coca-Cola, and just to pick a company out and you you bought signage at Madison Square Garden in Boston, you know, why do you need to buy signage in Hartford? That, that was a problem at that time. I don't know if it still would be, but that's kind of the situation. So kind of a mid-sized city. Um, the commissioner, Gary Bettman, had a vision then, still does now, for a big footprint for the sport. Hockey, as you know, is very regionalized for many years. And it wasn't until Bettman took over as commissioner in 94 that he saw the Sun Belt, you know, burgeoning, Florida, Texas, Arizona, you know, Las Vegas, Nashville, Seattle. You know, look what's happened here. Um, th this is really cool how the 32 member teams now are spread out in the NHL around the country. So to wedge a team into Hartford right now, I'm not sure it would work. If there's a wedge and maybe an area that deserves it, it's Quebec City. They had Colorado. They have a beautiful building. They would be like Winnipeg, Manitoba in Canada. They would sell out for years, it wouldn't be a problem. But again, it's revenue. It's corporations that can support the team. Look at the ownership group that supports the Kraken franchise and supports Climate Pledge Arena. It's deep. And because of that, you know, you, you're gonna need that community-based support, you know, real dollars backing a major league franchise to keep it where it needs to be competitive, full value for the fans and so on. So I'm not sure about that. The last game in Hartford in 1997 was a bittersweet moment. It was a real tough moment as a broadcaster. Uh, you had a job to do that day. And you also had a ton of emotion attached to this thing. We worked hard to keep it there. Uh, a lot of people have glossed over that over time and think that the owner was selfish and just wanted to uproot and get a better deal in North Carolina. Uh, sure, he wanted a better deal. What businessman or business person wouldn't? Um, but he but he obviously made an effort to keep it there. We had 98 plus percent capacity at the time of the move. The fans bought the tickets. They bought the season tickets. But it was corporate and political reasons that really broke it all down. So that day you were going in to call a game that was meaningless. And as I said, I think when we went on the air, a meaningless game with tremendous meaning because both teams were out of the playoffs, Tampa Bay and Hartford. Um, the game wasn't going to have any meaning in terms of the final outcome of that season. All the playoff spots were solidified, both in the East and the Western Conference. And this game was being played on a Sunday afternoon at 1.30. So the building was full. As we went to the third period, people wouldn't sit down. They wouldn't stop applauding. People were crying, getting really emotional. It was a, it was a tough day. I'm proud of what we did from a professional standpoint, because we kept it as real as we could. Um, it was hard to hold back the emotion, but we did get through it. And I think we delivered the story. The story was that these people, these fans of the Hartford franchise in the NHL and previous to it in the World Hockey Association were great. It's unfortunate that there was a governor that didn't see it that way, couldn't work with the owner who came from Detroit. Both those sides were polar opposites. And there you go, it was time to move. Ty, there's a lot, as you mentioned as a broadcaster, John, something you brought up is there's definitely some balancing where you have, obviously you have owners that 
have their agendas, but you have, you want to be truthful to fans too. And that probably that, that last game in, in Hartford probably reflected those balances. There was obviously emotion, but there's a, from your standpoint, there was a business side to it as well. I could kind of tell there were some tough balances you were going through that, that day. Sure. And, and for me too, because not everyone in our organization was asked to migrate South. Um, I was, but I had a year left on my contract. I also was up for the job in Boston with the Bruins. Um, they had a long time a television announcer by the name of Fred Cusick, who did it for 40 years, who was an influence when I was a young boy too on, on my broadcast style. But when he, when he decided to retire, uh, the Boston Herald did a story that uh, uh, they asked him who should succeed you. And he said, me. So the TV 38 had the uh, road games at the time and the New England Sports Network, as they do today, um, had just the home games. It was the 38 gig, the road games. And it was myself, Sean McDonough, and a guy by the name of Dave Shea that were the three finalists. I pulled myself out of the running to go to North Carolina to be loyal to Jim Rutherford, who gave me my first opportunity. It was a great move for us as a family. Uh, we came to Virgin area in terms of hockey, but we were able to help it grow. Uh, similar to coming to Seattle the same way at this stage of my career. It's funny that I get a chance to mark time twice. Um, my wife, we had a one-year-old and my wife was eight months pregnant when we moved to Raleigh. Um, so it was a difficult personal situation, but um, it was great for us. So anyway, that's kind of uh, was also part of my mood that day was like, what was going to happen to me in the future? I really had no idea. I just started my career. And now this was happening. And I was doing a little national work with ESPN at the time, but it was scary. It was very anxious. I bet. You know, John, you may have sort of read my next question. And the Hurricanes moved um, from Hartford in 97. I know it's a little bit different situation when the frack, the Kraken started in 2021. Um, one was a relocation. One was an expansion situation. But, John, tell us about what, what were some similarities and differences you have seen with the first NHL year in Carolina in 97 and the first NHL year in, in Seattle in 2021. Compare and contrast a bit if you can. It's a really hard comparison because the a generation is past and the times, Paul, are completely different. And what I mean by that is we re relocated from Hartford to North Carolina in four months. And it hasn't been done in professional sports, to my knowledge, a four month relocation of a major league franchise. Sure, you know, Baltimore packed up and went to Indianapolis, but I believe they had more time than this thing did. And then our building wasn't ready yet for two years. So the Hurricanes had to play in Greensboro, North Carolina, 70 minutes um, northwest of Raleigh. Uh, completely out of market in a building that wasn't ready for the game. So by the time we got to Raleigh in 99, we had already played two seasons. We had somewhat of a fan base, but we're starting over again. Seattle, everything was organized. Everything was an expansion bid that was, you know, years in the making, finally granted, huge money behind it, a building that's second to none, opening that building in year one, a season ticket base that was built in, you know, people stepping up to pledge money to support the team. Todd Lewicki doing an amazing job organizing all of this so that the market in Seattle were ready for the Kraken. They were ready a year ago at this time when we had that beautiful day and we had the expansion, expansion draft. Um, they were already with bated breath waiting for the team. That wasn't the case here. But the similarities that I see are this, are new fans, people who are new to hockey. There's a tremendous amount of hockey. It's right. Those are the people that, for whatever reason, get the spark and become some of your greatest fans. And so over time here in the Tar Heel State, I was able to see great fans migrate from the north, have their allegiances to the game, maybe another team other than the Hurricanes that they liked. That was one group of fans, but then there were the people who sat down in the arena for the very first time and saw the game. And that's an organic growth of fandom. That is what we're seeing with many of the fans in Seattle. To me, that's the reward. You know, that's the reward when I get an email 
asking me what I mean by this phrase, what I mean by this. We even see it with our production team. You know, many of the people that work, the men and women that work on our crews in Seattle, they're coming over from the Mariners. And a lot of the camera operators have never seen a hockey game, very little of it. And over the course of the season, became captivated by the game because the game sells itself when you see it live. And so they were jumping on board. And by the end of the year, they were like, we can't wait to start next year because it is so bloody exciting. I mean, hockey is an unbelievable frenetic game paid at a high level of pace that really captivates fans because of the excitement of the game and the nonstop play. So the game sells itself. And I think that's the similarities that I see. Well, it's such a fascinating answer that the, 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 the Kraken launch was so much more pre-planned in many ways than the, than the Hartford move to Carolina. But a lot, a lot of information there, John. And John, I shared with you, I communicate to you off the air that my hockey IQ is not that great. I barely knew what a power play was before this year started. You know, okay. so, um, we're, it's an easy, it's an we're easy learning. game. We're learning. We're getting, learning. Yeah. John, so before the Kraken started for the, the first year of the 2021-2022 season, this, is one pun, this was one pundit's prediction. There was a Seattle Times hockey writer and she predicted the Kraken would be the 15th best of the 32 franchises for last season. The Kraken Mm -hmm. ended up being the 30th best of the 32 Mm -hmm. franchises. Although it was a fun year in a lot of ways, John, were you surprised the Kraken were not a little bit more competitive? Yeah, I I thought they would be, but two things uh, played into this. I also, like many, underestimated the Pacific Division. Most people a year ago, Paul, looked at the Pacific Division and saw Vegas as a clear-cut first-place team, and then everybody else kind of the same. And the three California teams as teams that would really struggle because they're going through a rebuild. No one saw the LA Kings making the playoffs, and they did. With a really young team, they did a remarkable job. The Edmonton Oilers and the Calgary Flames had spectacular seasons. Edmonton is supported by world-class talent in Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Right. And Calgary, under the leadership of their coach, Daryl Sutter, and a goalie that had nine shutouts, had a remarkable year. And Vegas chased its tail all year and didn't make the playoffs. Now, what about the Kraken? The Kraken, I thought, underachieved. And I had them a lot better than they were. I had them in and around a playoff spot. The only thing I said a year ago at this time and leading into the season was this. I hoped for our fan base there would be meaningful hockey played in March and April. And there wasn't from a statistical standpoint. The cool thing about it was the energy in the building from the fans never wavered. So even in some of the games that were played very late in the season, when the Kraken were long gone, it wasn't just their broadcaster that was amazed. It were the players that couldn't believe the energy from the crowd, even when they knew the Kraken were long gone. So I think what happened was the Vegas Golden Knights success in year one, where they played for the Stanley Cup, kind of cursed the Kraken in, in terms of where the mindset was. The fans were ready for that. Maybe some of the owners of the Kraken were ready for that. Maybe some of the upper management was ready for that. I'm not sure Ron Francis believed that was going to happen. He was very guarded with everything he said and still is because he has a long range plan for how he wants to build the team. And then when the season started, some of those losses and injuries and COVID all came together at once and they got really frustrated. They got off their identity and played miserable hockey you know, nine game losing streak, you know, in the first two months of the season, it's really hard to recover. And then there was another long one too. So there was a couple prolonged losing streaks that really hurt the team. So I think in the second half, they kind of picked up their tails. They kind of fought through the COVID thing the best they could. Remember as an expansion team, there's no depth. There's no organizational depth. There's no pro players to dip into. When your core gets injured or COVID uh, strikes the team, you're done. You're bringing in young kids who aren't ready to play in the NHL or American Hockey League players. There's only a handful of them that we had all season in Charlotte. So it was real difficult. So it's kind of a a negative, perfect storm. And I thought they would be better than they were. And I think they started to show a little bit of that in the second half of how good they could be, but it was too far gone. And some key injuries like the Brandon Tanev and some of the things that happened that where players were lost 
key parts of what uh, they were about as an I identity really hurt the team. John, you know, I, I want to go back in a minute about the Kraken's first season, but I do have a question here from my producer, Lucius. And Lucius mentions that you, that you mentioned that when you were a kid growing up, uh, reading wasn't really your thing, but your mother encouraged you to read sports books. And what is your favorite sports book uh, today and why? My favorite book um, all time is Boys of Summer, Roger Angel, right? That to me um, was a book that was about the 1950s and the Brooklyn Dodgers, but I had no recollection of that growing up, but it was a historic book to a kind of captivated uh, um, captured the time period and anything. I really enjoyed that book. Um, Stan Fischler is a hockey writer, still going today. Um, and the majority of the books that centered around the history of hockey in the United States were authored by Stan and his wife, Shirley. And he was a longtime writer for Sports Illustrated too. So I've told Stan that he is directly responsible for me knowing who Maurice the Rocket Richard was and who Eddie Shore was and all these guys, Jacques Plante, that players that I could not get a handle on. But I'm old enough, Paul, I'm 60, so I'm old enough to go back to the early 70s and remember, you know, Bobby Orr and Phil Esposito and a lot of these great players and then follow it all the way up. But uh, study halls in uh, library time in high school, I put my schoolwork aside and I would uh, dive into some of that history and uh, through something they called an encyclopedia. Remember that? So that, uh, that, that's the first thing we ever had that resembled Google. But anyway, but that's, that's what I did. Well, you know, you mentioned Roger Angel. He just died a couple months ago, like 102 years yeah. old. So he, he lived yeah. a long life. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I encourage listeners to like, comment, subscribe, and go to sportsuntoldpodcast.com. I'm having a great conversation with Kraken TV broadcaster, John Forslund. John, real quickly, uh, if you had to pick one highlight, what was your favorite highlight of the Kraken's first year? My favorite highlight was the first um, afternoon game. It was on Martin Luther King Day. And it was an unbelievable uh, uh, energetic crowd uh, in, a, in a season filled with many of those. The Kraken won the game, won the game in a shootout. Um, it was well played. There was great goaltending from Marc-Andre Fleury of the Blackhawks at the time, Philip Grubauer. To me, that was a day where I came out of the building and I was like, wow, that was, that was sensational. It felt like a playoff game. We had a lot of nights, a lot of days like that. Um, the first win was awesome in Nashville to call the first win, that first five game road trip that we embarked on. That was great. The skills competition was thrown together by Kraken management in a period of maybe three weeks. The building was as full as you could get it on that Saturday afternoon. The players were taken in by the crowd, the size of the crowd, the emotion of the crowd. That was a day where I felt connection with the community. And remember, Paul, COVID hurt a lot of the team events. We couldn't have direct contact with the fans. We couldn't, as broadcasters, have contact with the players or the coaches as much as we would like to. Even being on the same plane, everybody was masked up and we were told, don't talk to those guys. It's awfully hard to do this job not having that interaction, not being afforded that interaction. So hopefully this season will be a lot different. Well, I love it, John. You can take some great highlights for a team that didn't have that great of a year. I'm going to throw it out as a novice fan. I'm going to throw one of one of my favorite Kraken highlights. I thought it was neat that we beat the eventual uh, Stanley Cup camp. I went to that game, Stanley Cup champions, the Colorado Avalanche at home. I went to that game. That was fun. Yeah, no, that was great. Carolina was another game. They're an elite team. Um, Kraken beat them, beat Washington, beat the Florida Panthers, who won the President's Trophy. There's the league's best record. So there was a lot of those moments. But when you do that and you're not consistent and you're a new team, you know, then you can't you can't you can't uh, make an excuse for losing every game to Arizona. Right. So that happened, too. So those are the things that, you know, you've got to get through and navigate through the first year. Um, but there were some unbelievable moments the first game at climate pledge arena um was was remarkable so i mean there's just uh, there's just a lot of things that we're going to look back and and they're etched in time now and we're going to know that riley shane scored the first goal 
in preseason in Spokane. And 10 years from now and 20 years from now, somebody's going to dig that one up. And that Ryan Donato scored the first ever goal for the Kraken in Las Vegas in the first ever game played in the regular season. That will go down. First shutout, first hat trick, you know, all these things. Um, the first icing, the first offside, we're going to forget about those. But for most. John, there was a recent announcement that NHL player turned broadcaster um, hopefully I'm pronouncing Eddie's last name properly. Help me out here, John. Is Eddie Ol Ol Olchek. Olchek. Eddie Olchek mm -hmm. uh, is going to be teaming up now with you and JT Brown as part of the Kraken um, TV team. Tell us a bit about Eddie and what can the fans expect when you and JT work with Eddie? Well, the, it hasn't been officially announced yet, but it has it has been out there. And I know they're they're working and having conversations with Eddie, who's who's available now because of his contractual situ situation with Chicago. He and I are great friends. Um, we have done a couple of hundred, maybe more games together with national networks over time, going all the way back to ESPN when we were both starting in this. Um, and most recently with Turner and uh, many years with NBC together. Um, he's a lead analyst in the National Hockey League. If we do add him to the group, we've made a very good team even better. I'm very proud of what JT and myself, the entire broadcast did in the first year. Uh, JT came into an interesting situation. Um, the hire was historic because it got to the diversity messaging that the Kraken stand for, which is great. But by and large, this is a player who had seven years experience that was never drafted, that played in the Stanley Cup final with the Tampa Bay Lightning, who got into broadcasting and had really no um, idea how to do it and organically worked really hard, came together. I think our chemistry was good. Um, if, if Eddie is in the fold, again, Eddie has a history of JT too, which goes back to when JT was a junior hockey player and played with one of Eddie's sons. Um, we're we're going to have a great mix. And our, and our goal is the same as it was in the first year, Paul. Earn the trust of the fans and continue to do that. You never get there. Every season provides you with different challenges. So you have to continue to earn their trust and deliver a gold standard. And I know with Eddie coming on board, he's got great personality. He can describe the game really well. He can break it down. He can break it down at all levels, whether you're a new fan, an ardent fan. Um, and then we're going to have the chemistry of, if it is, you know, the three of us, with our personalities being as they are, you have to be yourself to be, uh, to be real in this industry. It's really hard because people want to emulate others. I always tell young broadcasters, don't do that. Someone else has already done that. Be yourself. And that's what Nick JT did in the first year. I was very proud of. He worked really hard. He loves the game, but he was himself, which allowed me to be myself. And I think we we really had a good tandem. John, you and JT were great together. If Eddie's added to your TV cast, uh, let's, that'll be wonderful too. I got a question for you, John, from the audience. Um, Greg Guile, one of my classmates at Roosevelt High School in Seattle, wants to know what you like to do during the off season. What I like to do in the off season is move my kids around. That seems like that's all I'm doing this summer. Um, I got three young adults and I have my oldest who's transitioning jobs. She works as part of the administration at Clemson University. She's taken a promotion, a new job at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So I'm moving her. That's why we had to delay this one day. No problems. Um, my son um, works for USA Baseball as an accountant. He's a he's a he's a accountant, but he's going to law school at Duquesne, and he's moving to Pittsburgh. And we helped him move last weekend. And my youngest is a burgeoning freshman at UNC Chapel Hill, and we're moving her in two weeks. So that appears to be all I'm doing. But what I what I like to do in the off season, every off season, is just reconnect with my family. Um, we've had a great life. My wife and I will be going on 36 years together. And, um, and she's put up with a lot in this business. You know, I'm gone a lot during the hockey season. There's immense travel almost on a daily basis. There's a lot more hours that go into this that might meet the eye when you turn on the television. Um, and because of that, a lot of sacrifice. But don't get me wrong, no one's complaining. I've never worked a day in my life because of my profession. That's the way I feel. I'm healthy, thank God. And I hope to do this cracking situation, this gig for a long, long time. That's my goal. Love it. Love it. John, speaking of the, of the off season, the Kraken have made all sorts of acquisitions in recent days. They drafted yeah. Shane Wright, signed free agent, 
I may bungle the last name. Let me do my best. Andre Burkowski landed Good job. Oliver Bajorkstrand a trade. Um, which of these, and there's more, I, I don't have all of them. Which of these moves do you think will be the most significant for the crack in 2022, 2023 year? Well, to earmark one would be they really have to improve their power play. The, the power play last season, again, lots of moving pieces, lots of changes, um, everybody being new, a coach that's trying to learn and scheme a power play. But by adding Burakovsky, who is a top six, so I mean first two line player on a championship level team who can score goals, who now will try and repurpose into a really high end top three forward on this team. Um, Oliver Bjorkstrand is an outstanding player. Um, he is he's really good on anybody's power play. The Kraken were in a lucky position because of uh, the signing of Johnny Gaudreau in Columbus, the re-signing of Patrick Laine. There wasn't any cap room for Bjorkstrand. He was available. Ron Francis smartly had the cap space, was able to get this player for a couple of draft choices that he traded for at the trading deadline by getting rid of about a half dozen guys. So all of those moves come into play here. And then there's Justin Schultz, who's a third pairing defenseman, five, six guy, not a one, two, three, four, in my opinion, anymore, but is a really good power play specialist that was kind of in the shadows in Washington behind John Carlson. He'll now get a chance to quarterback the power play with Vince Dunn. Those three guys should really help the power play. Um, you know, everything else that they've been able to do, the drafting of Shane Wright was a no brainer. Great luck that it fell to where it did in terms of Wright being available to the Kraken. He, along with Matty Beniers, second overall pick in the first draft ever for the Kraken, are going to be the foundation for this team for a decade plus. And then Philip Grubauer's bounce back year and goal. Paul, that's going to be really important. You know, he was signed uh, last offseason, a guy who was one of three finalists for the Vesna Trophy as a top goalie in the NHL, didn't play to the level didn't really live up to the expectation. He knows it. He wants to make better on it. He will. I think he's an outstanding goalie. So those things come into play. And then Dave Haxtall, the coach, kind of learning his team and trying to reinforce their identity in year two. Let's see what steps they make. You like a lot of the moves they made, though, in the offseason of Kraken. I do. I, I think it's, it's, still, it's still a foundational approach. You know, that's the one thing I'd say to the fans, please understand that although it sounds like a GM that's, you know, probably going to a cliche over and over again, or sports writers who will either be, be good with that or poke holes in it and say, you know, you got to win now. Um, you still have to go through the proper way to get to elite status and by drafting and developing players, and you already have the second overall pick in Beniers, the fourth overall pick in Wright, and all these other kids have been drafted in and around the first two years, you know, kind of let them grow. And also, you know, you're bringing back a group of veterans who now know Seattle, know what it's all about. You know, you had 23 to 26 individuals come into a, a facility for the first time and see it, move into a city for the first time and live it. And it's easier said than done. You know, what Vegas did was lightning in a bottle. I don't know if we'd ever see that again. But in this case, you know, these guys are going to come in knowing that they want to make good on it. And they really want to reward the fans who are very supportive in the first year. So, yeah, I think they'll be incrementally better. But I don't know what that means because you have to see how the division plays out too, where some of these other teams are. Was L.A. a flash in the pan? Are some of their first year players who were really good at a high level, are they gonna be able to match it again? Uh, they've done some very smart things through, through free agency too, but you gotta see if the teams come back to the pack a little bit and if a team like the Kraken can take a step and where it leads it. A lot there. John, I've asked these two questions about every guest I've had since late 2019. I get amazing answers. Um, who's a living sports figure? It can be a, a manager, an owner, a player you'd love to have a conversation with. And who's a deceased sports person in history you would have loved to have chatted and spent time with? Well, uh, one goes back to a name I mentioned early, which is Dan Kelly. Um, I wish Dan was still alive. Dan died in the 1980s. 
very young of cancer. And um, when I was working in Springfield, we had a head coach by the name of Jimmy Roberts, who played for the St. Louis Blues when Dan was announcing the St. Louis Blues for that team that lost the Boston Bruins. And he put me on the phone with Dan and I talked to Dan and Dan gave me two pieces of advice. He said, number one, never lose your passion for the game, which is pretty much by and large what everybody has to maintain, no matter what vocation, what line of work you're in. But number two, he said, never sell a goal down or a big save, even if it's the other team, because it's a great moment. And I remember when I started with the Kraken, some fans were like, geez, he gets a little excited even when the other team scores. It's because that moment deserves it. You know, I dial it back down when it's appropriate. And when the Kraken score, I take it from the goal moment to another place, hopefully, with a catchphrase or my energy or playing off the crowd, whatever it is. So you know where the bed is, where the bread is buttered. You know where that's coming from. The one conversation I'd like to have with someone living today in our industry is Vin Scully. I never met Vin Scully. I'd like to meet Vin Scully. I'd like to talk to Vin Scully. I'd like to trade secrets with Vin Scully and just get to know him because I have had the opportunity to work under and with Mike Emmerich, Doc Emmerich, the great hockey broadcaster with NBC for a number of years. He has been a direct mentor for me. I know him. I can text him. I texted him from Pittsburgh last, week, last weekend. I was at a pirate game and that's his favorite team. But then I've ne never met Vin Scully. And I would really like to just pick his brain and spend a couple of hours with him because there's two things working here. Great broadcaster, what appears to be even a better guy class. And I've tried to maintain that. I learned that from Doc Emmerich. I watched how he handled himself within the game, what coaches had to say about him, what players had to say about him. You know, what we do, you have to have respect for the game and its players and coaches. They're the event. It's not you. You're just providing some entertainment and some informational value and being a conduit for the fans, but never lose sight of it. Sometimes in this ego business, Ego takes over and you think, well, oh, I might be the show. No, that's not the case. Even Vin Scully and all of his greatness, whether it was doing golf way back when, the NFL way back when, or the Dodgers forever, I never got that. It was like, wow, this guy really respects the game itself. And um, that's very important for me. Great answers. Nobody had answered Vin Scully as a living sports figure yet. They'd love to chat with. And the name Dan Kelly, it's interesting to hear another name of a deceased sports figure. Um, I, I'm with you on Vin Scully. What, what a talent. And I, I love the way he, he's, he broadcasts those LA Dodgers games. I'm sort of chuckling for a minute, John. There was one famous sportscaster, though, who thought he was the show, Howard Cassell. So <laughs> No doubt about it. And it worked. And he laughed all the way to the bank. Right, and it was right. unique, though. But guess what? There was only one Howard, right? right. There's only one guy that could pull that off. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, him and him and the champ, right? Him and Muhammad Ali. That's some of the greatest stuff we've ever seen. Can I get two or three more questions in, John? I'll let sure. you go. Yeah, you've been doing sure. your time, John. Uh, let's, let's narrow it to hockey. Who's a living hockey figure you'd love to spend some time with and chat with? Who's a deceased hockey figure in history you'd love to spend some time with? Well, <clears throat> let's see. I'd like to spend more time than I did with Gordy Howe. Gordy Howe's deceased. And my first year in Hartford, Gordy worked in my department. He was in community relations. He was playing out a special services part of his contract after he retired. The team never used him for anything. He came to the office every day and I couldn't believe it. So I said, Gordy, you want to go to practice with me? And we would drive to the practice rink every day and he'd tell me stories and I'd pick his brain. And I stayed friendly with him, but not close enough over time. That'd be a deceased great of our sport. Great name. And the other one, the other one is, is Wayne Gretzky. Um, Bobby Orr, Bobby Orr, my, my idol growing up, really helped me years later get into Hartford which was an interesting story, but I, I've been friends with Bobby and um, um, I, I, I got to know him as he went into the sports agency business over the last 20 years, I'd say. But Wayne Gretzky is somebody I covered, um, not somebody I talked to enough. Um, I would love to spend some one-to-one -one time with him because not only his place in the game, he's a contemporary, we're the same age. So we followed the game as kids 
the same way. Because if you listen to Wayne, he's a historian. He he's never lost the fan portion of who he was as a young boy, and neither have I. So I'd like to go back into the early 70s and relive some of his memories of going to see the Toronto Maple Leafs at uh, storied Maple Leaf Gardens. And I could bring up the Bruins and storied Boston Garden, and we could trade those stories back and forth, which we've never, we've been together professionally a lot and at functions, but I've never had like a round of golf with Wayne Gretzky. He, he kicked my, he kicked me to the curb. I know that. But I'd love to talk to him for hours like that, where you could just get into that type of a conversation. It would have nothing to do with broadcasting or the NHL today. It would be all about what it was like to be a kid in the 1970s, which was really special. Great names. Will there ever be another Gretzky in the NHL? No, there won't be because he completely dominated the game. 62, 63 records that still stand. Um, there never will be. <clears throat> it was perfect timing. He was in the right slot for his skill set to dominate the game. Um, but he did right by the game, too. He was a tremendous ambassador for the sport. He had time for all of us in the media. Sidney Crosby has had time for all of us in the media. That's something I'd like to see Connor McDavid work through a little bit. I think Connor is like a lot of young athletes today, a little bit guarded. Mm -hmm. They're living in a different world of social media than they're their predecessors did. I mean, Wayne just had to worry about a beat writer or two and what was going to be in the paper the next day. And it took hours to get there, as you'll recall. But today, the venom that spewed on Twitter and a lot of places with these athletes puts them in a place where they don't need anybody and they really don't want to let themselves be exposed, so to speak, to anybody either. Um, but our game is in really good hands with the young players today, Paul. And Connor McDavid, if you could take a little bit of Wayne and a little bit of Sydney, soften up just a little bit, he's a tremendous young man. And he's an unbelievable talent. And I know there's a different side than we see. That's the only, my only hope that I'd like to see. But we have... He's not alone. We've got a long list of young players that are going to carry this game for a long time. Great, great names. You know, um, I'll share with you, I find the legal and business sides of sports interesting. Gary Bettman would be a living NHL figure I would find interesting to chat yeah. with, the Commissioner. I think I he'd really, yeah, I think he'd love that um, because, you know, he still gets booed every time he makes a public appearance, um, but he's a tremendous commissioner. You know, three work stoppages and the work stoppages really had nothing to do with greed on either side. It had to do with, is this actually going to work or not? Right. You know, he took over a league that was in big trouble, that was playing with a free market system that you, you couldn't be supported by revenues, television or anything that props up the three major sports. So he's done a really good job of navigating through three work stoppages, including a canceled season, which has never been done. But in hindsight, almost had to happen. I think he would enjoy it. And then his expansion footprint and, you know, still uh, getting through some of the troubled waters that he has to navigate through. Um, he's remarkable. Really Very remarkable. True. Be interesting that. Well, John, you've been so generous with my time. This is my final question. Um, what's your favorite sports movie? My favorite sports movie. Oh, boy. I don't know. Um, there's a real good movie that didn't get a lot of play. You know, I could say Slapshot. My favorite movie of all time is Caddyshack, right? That's my favorite movie of oh, all time. Yeah. But but uh, Kevin Costner was in for the love of the game. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but the the way he was depicted as a pro athlete, it basically it's a it's a love story, which is okay because you know you, you can watch it in uh, um, in mixed company and everybody's happy. But it, but it's it really kind of got to um, uh, the realness of, of of the game, the way I see it, being involved in it, and and reproducing like Miracle, the movie about the uh, Olympic gold medal team, nineteen eighty. Right. Great movie. Kurt Russell was great at it, but the 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 scenes are hard to replicate. Like it's hard to believe, but for some reason. Uh, the way they 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 did for the love of the game, a lot of it was shot in Yankee Stadium. Seemed pretty real. Um, so I, I, I kind of liked that movie and I liked the story. And I think uh, Rene Russo was the lead in that movie. And those two were great together. It was a really good movie. 
Kevin Costner comes up a lot as a movie, as an actor. Yeah, also. Bull Durham, of course, you know, and all right. those, you know, he was great at that. Um, that too was a, was a really, was a, was a, was a really good sports movie that was real. Um, and, and, but uh, Slapshot is just something that to me, I like, but I also, I remember when it came out and we lived in a minor league city and I was like, geez, I hope my idols when I was 13, 14 years old, aren't like this. Right. Um, right. Tough maybe guys. they were. So that's kind of how I looked at Slapshot today. I I'm kind of with you on that too. Yeah. 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 Well, so yeah. what a great hour. Thank you so much for coming on sports untold also on Rainier app radio. And I, I'll be following you and thank you so much for doing this, John. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. And uh, have a great summer and look forward to next season. You too. Thank you, John. Thank you.